This is Bill McLeod speaking from Winnipeg, Canada, January 2006. I want to speak first of all about tribulation and the Great Tribulation. Now I want to speak on God and what has been called the Judgment Mode. Job 5 7 says that man is born of the trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job 41 says that the man is born of the born of a woman is a few days and is full of trouble. John 16 Jesus said, In the world you shall have tribulation. Acts 14 22, Paul said, We must through much tribulation inherit the kingdom. In 2 Timothy 8 and 9, a Paul asked us to remember that Jesus Christ is the seed of David, raised from the dead, according to my gospel. Then he said, When I suffer trouble, as an evil do, even unto bonds. And in Revelation 1 9, John said that he was a companion in the tribulation. A different art was there in the original. All right, so tribulation is the common lot of men, and then for Christians, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but thank God, the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now, apart from this kind of tribulation, which uh, we all experience and go through, we have what the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. Daniel spoke of it in chapter 12, verse 1. He said there would be a time of trouble such as never was up to that time. In Matthew 20, point 21, Christ said, Then shall be great tribulation such as was not, nor would ever again be. Luke 21, 25-7, in clear language, Christ said, And upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves war, and men's hearts failing for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. All right, in the last days, Paul, 2 Timothy 3, 1, he said that in the last days perilous times would come. Perilous, some translation say dangerous, difficult, hard, perilous times, dangerous times. The reason being, he says, in the context, the men should be lovers of their own selves. And again, he says in the context, the men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, or instead of lovers of God. John speaks in Revelation 12, 7 to 9 about there being war in heaven. That seems very strange. War in heaven? How can it be war in heaven where God rules and reigns? But that's exactly what he said there in Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 7. Michael and his angels fought against the devil and his angels, and um, the devil was cast out and his angels went to the earth and says he has great wrath because he knows he only has a short time. Let's describe those <coughs> last days, Matthew 24, 12. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many, literally the love of the many, shall get cold. So, in Revelation 11, 18, we read, we have an angry world and an angry God in the Persian course. It's exactly what it says, and the nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time of the dead, they should be judged, and you should give reward unto your servants the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fill your name, small and great. So we have an angry devil because he knows he only has a short time, Revelation 12, 12. Was he cast out? Has he already been cast out? Or is it different to opinion among Bible scholars? I'll tell you what I think. Revelation 2, 13 speaks about Pergamos. Twice it says that that's where Satan's throne is. While his throne was in heaven, it's gone. So I take it for granted that Satan has been cast out of heaven already. Then we want to talk about God and the judgment mode, which I think as a world we have already entered into to some extent. Israel, Amos 3, 2, God said, You only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for your iniquities. And in Matthew 27, 24, and 5, you'll recall when Pilate was trying to get them to release Christ, and he took a basin of water and washed his hands and uh, they said, His blood be on us and on our children. Now, in Luke 21, 23, it says, Speaking not of the future, but of the past, at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, AD 70, he said, um, There shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And in 1 Thessalonians 2, 15 and 16, Paul said, 
that the wrath of God has come on Israel to the uttermost. And that phrase I understand means in point of time. There is no way you can understand the history of this nation without understanding what's going on. They persecuted the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. They killed some of them. And then the New Testament days, you know how they persecuted the apostles. Christ said, some of you, speaking to the twelve, they will persecute their children, crucify. He warned them about this. And of course, uh, this happened, certainly. And so there's great distress among these people and wrath from God. But as Christian people, we must love them, <clears throat> pray for them, and encourage them to think of their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the true Messiah of God. All right? Great distress wrath on this people. And Gentile nations too under the judgment of God. In Jeremiah one ten, when Jeremiah was uh, called by God to be a prophet, he was called to be a prophet to the nations, not just to Israel. And so um, he was told to to root out and tear down and throw down. And uh, he's speaking here of nations of the world. And of course he did that. And in a very, very clear way. You recall he in Jeremiah 25, there's 27 nations that he spoke of as being under the judgment of God. Now, Proverbs 26, 2 says, the curse will never come without a cause. I made a special study that one time, uh, marking in the margin every verse in the Bible that deals with this thing, this truth, and I was amazed. There were literally hundreds of verses. The curse will never come without a cause. The word because, because, frequently in the Old Testament scriptures. So it'll never come without a cause. Ezekiel 14, 23, God said, I have not done without cause all that I have done. So God is taking responsibility for what he has done, and uh, he hasn't done any of it without a cause. He's been driven to do it because of certain evil things that nations are doing. Psalm 55, 19 says, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. And so God brings changes, changes in the weather, changes in many ways, many different ways, economic downturns and changes in pestilences and in war and so on. He does this because they won't listen to the soft tones of the gospel of Christ, so he speaks to them in, in judgment. Uh, helping them, hoping that they'll listen to what he says. Ezekiel 14.21 speaks of a uh, four-sword judgment that God uses in judging the nation of the world. The sword, the famine, pestilence, and beasts. The hurtful beasts. Second Kings 17.25-6 There was no fear among these people who came from Babylon and other areas to live in the cities of Israel were now uh, empty because they had been carried into captivity. There was no fear of God among the sources that God sent lions among them. And then they began to fear God and they asked for help. And they sent a priest down to help them understand who this God of Israel really was. First Chronicles 5.11 says, There fell down many slain because the war was of God. The war was of God. And because of this are many slain. It's exactly what it says. We've had two great world wars and millions of people died. In the last World War, they compute that probably more civilians died than soldiers died because of the indiscriminate bombing of cities all through Europe. And of course, added to, to these four sword judgments, there's floods and fires and earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and volcanoes and uh, communism in uh, Russia during the reign of that particular political system is computed around 30 million people died who opposed in any way the refused to go along with communism and in China probably 60 million. I got these figures from a very interesting book. It's, it's about uh, the, this black plague of communism and showing what has happened in country after country where they have uh, been in control. They would not stand for the slightest uh, devi deviation from the uh, role that they had assumed on themselves. They said that the Lenin and Stalin had a, had a phrase they used many times. It was simply shoot the pigs. If somebody was not 
going along, then shoot the pigs. That was what was said. That is what was done. What about today? Are we into a judgment mode? I think we are. Listen carefully. We have, first of all, the uh, terrible thing that happened in Oklahoma where some hundreds of people died in a sudden blast. Many children died. Then we have New York where a couple of thousand people died without warning. Then we have New Orleans where a modern city is wiped off the map. And then in Canada we've had from east to west uh, much rain. Job 37.13 says, that um, God sometimes sends rain for correction, for correction. And we've had that in certain parts of Canada. Well, in the, in the maritime provinces, the eastern provinces of Canada, the last winter they had um, oh, three or four blizzards that were so heavy that people, some people were talking about throwing their shoulders away and going to the house and just hibernating until they could get the streets cleared. Then in the province of Ontario, they had a terrible ice storm. Over 30 people died. In uh, some places, there were some weeks without uh, electrical power. Uh, many people came up from the States to help Canada in this uh, particular tragedy. But uh, we've, we've had it too here in Canada, I'm saying. And that's what we need to understand. Then in the province, I live in Manitoba for two years now. We've had too much rain. And, and farmers, some farmers have had no crops for two years now, and the weather forecasters are telling us we're going to have another wet year this year. And uh, many farmers are simply packing it up and moving to other parts of the country where they can get a job to support themselves. One farmer told me that uh, he's farmed a thousand acres. He got in about 50 acres in the spring. That's all he could get in due to the wet weather. And he doubted that he'd get five acres harvested in the fall. Ben Albert had a gulf for several years in British Columbia, most westerly province. They had serious fires this year, that is last year, in 2005, and hundreds of homes were burned. Thank God no people were, were hurt, but uh, certainly it was a very bad time. So we've had it all across Canada, and if you remember the fourth sword judgment, one of them was what is called hurtful beasts, that is beasts that attack people. Well, we've had that too, you know, because in here in North America, both in, in the States and Canada, we've had uh, cougars and bears attacking people. And uh, here in Canada, we've had people killed by bear attacks. And um, not only that, but uh, we've had in the province I live in, that is Manitoba, recently, we've had two cases where bears, uh, not, not being hunted, not being molested in any way, no cubs around, the bears are suddenly rushed from the bush and attacked some people. There are two separate incidents where people were had to be hospitalized. They were not killed, but they were very badly scratched and chewed, and uh, for no reason at all. This is something that we've never had this before. The Bible speaks of this is one of God's four sore judgments. That's what it's called. Remember? All right, this is what is happening. Then when it comes to the fish, you know, on the west coast of Canada, the salmon uh, stocks are being depleted and they don't know what's happened. They're, they're just sort of fading away to some extent. And on the East Coast, it's the cod. And scientists are saying, studying this cod thing, see, they're not uh, depleted, they've just disappeared. We don't know where they are. They've simply gone. We don't know what to make of this. Well, in Hosea 4 3 and Zephaniah 1 3, it says that God takes the fish of the sea away. God does it sometimes as a judgment. And then, of course, you remember the tsunami waves when maybe 200,000 people died. And then this year in the United States, after the tornado season was over, uh, they had many, many tornadoes. And it was so unusual, and very difficult times and uh, much destruction. And then these tsunami waves, uh, what, how does this happen? Why did a thing like this happen with maybe 200,000 people losing their lives and billions of dollars and property damage and so on. Well, the Bible has something you know to say about that, and we need to look at that very carefully. Now, in Naaman, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of the sea. The Lord has his way in these tornadoes. The Lord has his way in these huge hurricanes, the storm, because they're called whirlwinds, and that's exactly what the hurricanes are, exactly what the tornadoes are, and God takes responsibility for that. I remember during the uh, time after the, uh, those waves had hit, 
they would have pictures on TV of a bedraggled group of people, maybe 25 people or so, and they would explain these people came from a village where 800 people lived. Uh, these were all that survived. And uh, in Amos 5, verse 3, it speaks about the city that went out by a thousand, returning by a hundred. And then in verse 9 of the same uh, fifth chapter of Amos, it says that the Lord uh, sends the waters of the sea, or takes the waters of the sea, and pours them out on the face of the earth. That's repeated in chapter 9 of Amos, verse 6. God takes the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. Psalm 148, verse 8 says, Stormy wind fulfilling God's word. Amos 4.13 declares that God creates the wind. So it's not Mother Nature, people, it's Father God. And he's angry with the world because of their... Well, the Jew, he's angry with the Jew because he rejected the Messiah. He's angry with the world because we are rejecting the gospel of Messiah, the Son of God dying for the sins of men, and people totally ignoring this. Then pestilence, that's one of the four sword judgments, that's disease. There used to be just two uh, sexual diseases, gonorrhea and syphilis. Now there's 25 of them. Why is this? And this thing called AIDS, millions affected. Now listen carefully to what I'm saying. Don't misquote me in this. It's basically a sin problem because if people are not fornicating and committing adultery and so on, uh, having sex with people they're not married to, which is happening all around the world, then it is a sin problem. You can't blame the children to get AIDS for that. You have to blame their parents. But the real problem, people, is this, that it's become in North America particularly a political problem instead of a medical problem. You know what I mean by that? Exactly what I said. You see, think of Japan for a moment. Japan has maybe 130 million people. Canada has 30 million. And uh, they have less... Uh, AIDS in Japan than they have in Canada. And why is that? Well, in Japan, if a doctor discovers you have AIDS, he has to report you immediately. He can be severely chastised if he doesn't report you, and you will be quarantined immediately. It's a, it's a medical problem there, not a political problem. Here in North America, it's a political problem. That is, certain people are screaming, if I have AIDS, you have no right to know that. You can't betray this. It's a, it's a trust, and I have a right to, to secrecy here. No, they don't have a right. This is a political problem. And so because it's not a medical problem, people are not being quarantined. And so it's spreading much faster in the population. As a matter of fact, there are probably hundreds, maybe thousands of people who would not have died of AIDS in North America had it been treated as a medical problem. People with this particular disease, they need to be quarantined and taken care of. Both Japan and Cuba are treating it as a medical problem and they have basically a far smaller percentage of the people afflicted with this particular problem than here in Canada or in the USA. I wonder, I sometimes I'm amazed that the medical profession caved in to the demands of some people who wanted a left, just totally left alone. Then other diseases are making a comeback, the malaria, they thought they had it completely uh, beaten around the world. Now they find it's... Uh, resisting certain drugs we've been using in the past, and uh, there are other diseases besides, but this is happening too. And so, pestilence, God uses that. And this new flu carried by birds and so on, right now in Turkey there's numbers of cases of people dying with this particular flu. They're so afraid it's going to get out into the world as a whole, and then there could be hundreds of thousands of people die from it. Why is God allowing this? Well, he said, remember, I have not done without cause all that I have done. I have a reason for it, a cause for it. We may not know what that cause is, but we stop and think and look around. We can see. Another problem we're facing is uh, the fact Matthew 6, 24 says you cannot serve God and mammon. But people are trying to. People are trying to serve both God and mammon. You know, money has become such an important thing here in, in uh, North America such an important thing. People keep talking about the American dream. Well, it's a Canadian dream, too. You know, having a two-car garage and a number of vehicles and having a house with three or four bathrooms in it and uh, so on. And people are trying to make the kind of money so they can do this. And they think of something, and Christians have fallen to this as well. 
Let me tell you something. You couldn't buy a popsicle in heaven with a million dollars because our money is not current over there. Now, among Christians, we have the prosperity syndrome, as it has been called, that as a child of the king, that is a child of God, we should have a right to expect and to have uh, lots of money in the bank and uh, buy the things we like to have. They have a saying among these people, it's gab it and grab it. If you see something you really want, then you gab it. You, you pray about it. God will give it to you. You don't have to worry about this at all. This, in my opinion, is an extremely dangerous and unbiblical teaching and idea. Let's listen to what the Bible says. All right. Jesus said, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, that's himself, has not where to lay his head. We find references in uh, the Gospel of John to every man went to his own house, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. If you study the last verse of chapter, I think it's chapter 7 in John. And uh, so Jesus had no place to stay. And people are saying, oh, no, he, he was wealthy, he was wealthy. What about Peter? Well, he said to a uh, lame man, you're just going to heal. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to you. That's what Peter said. James says, hearken, my beloved, in James 2, 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? I read an article one time. This lady said, I absolutely refuse to be poor. And she was referring to this prosperity syndrome thing. She said, I have a right to be wealthy because my Heavenly Father is so wealthy. So I wrote her a letter. I got her address, wrote her a letter, and I asked her if she'd never read the James 2 5. And I, of course, quoted that in the letter. Hearken, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? People, I got a wonderful letter back from this lady. She apologized. She said, I will never, ever say that again that I'll not be poor, because she said, I, I didn't know this was in the Bible. Why are poor people rich in faith? Well, it is because they have to be in order to survive. When I start, listen to me, when I started off preaching 64 years ago, a little church in Northern Canada said they'd pay me $30 a month if the money came in. You know, it was a tail end of the dirty 30s, as, as it was called. And uh, so after six months, I got married, so two of us had to live on $30 a month. And in those days, if you had an ordinary job, you'd be making $100 or maybe $150 a month. So we were considerably short. How did we handle this? Well, two things. One, we decided to give God the tithe and the offering off our little pittance, but we did that faithfully from the very beginning. And the second thing was this. We determined, we made up our mind before God that we would never let anybody know if we had a, had a financial need. There's an old saying that if God knows your need, who else needs to know? God knows. And so we stayed that way. We, there were times we had no money and maybe had no food in the house, but it never lasted long. We could never say we were starving. In some way, I remember one time we had no money coming in for another two weeks. And we never had a nickel between us. And I got a, a check from England from a, a friend of mine, a check that would take care of us for probably two or three weeks. And things like that happened hundreds, hundreds of times. And so the poor of this world are rich in faith. And if I say again, it's not bad to be poor. It can be a real blessing to us. The Bible says, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. I can give you your total biography in just two statements. Nothing in, nothing out. That's what Paul said there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And the man of God is asked to flee uh, from this love of money. It doesn't mean anything. So those who suppose that gain is godliness in First Timothy chapter 6 also. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my help, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Well, we read about uh, in uh, Ezekiel 33, 31, Israel, with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. After Israel was spanked by God and sent into captivity for 70 years, they didn't fall into worshiping idols made of wood and stone again. But in Ezekiel 14, God said to the prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts. Now they, had, they were covetous. 
and covetousness is idolatry, and the covetous man is an idolatry, as so we read in Ephesians 5 and Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Okay, let your conduct be without covetousness. Keep that in mind. Israel and the world are under God's judgment because of the fact that we're chasing a piece of paper, a dollar bill. Do you know that in our world there are 75 countries where the average annual income is uh, 5% of what it is in Canada States? I talked to some men in India one time, and they were working for a tailor. I asked what they were making, and it worked out to about $2 a week. People, it's not $2 an hour, $2 a week. Recently, I heard uh, somebody on a TV program, and they were explaining that they were only making $27 an hour, and there's no way they could live on that, and they were thinking of striking, you know. $27 an hour? They can't live on that? It seems that no matter how much some people get, they have to have more. All right, so God is angry with the world because of this. And we've made money our God, and we're chasing it when we're an idolater in the eyes of God. No wonder that things are happening the way that they are happening. Then there's something else we need to consider, and that is the fact that God is shaking the nations. We're going to look at that in the Word of God. Job 38, 12, and 13 speaks about the day's been taking hold of the earth so that the wicked might be shaken out of it. In Luke 178, Jesus is the day spring. It means that there is a day coming in which Christ will remove the wicked from the earth, and it's spelled out in clear terms in Matthew 13. Isaiah 219, people hide in the rocks and caves when God arises to shake terribly the earth. Isaiah 13, 13, I'll shake the heavens and the earth shall move out of its place in the day of his fierce anger. Isaiah 24, 18 to 21, the wind is from higher open, the foundation of the earth is shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. The transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Joel 3.16, the Lord shall roar out of Zion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth shall shake. Haggai 2, 6, and 7, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once it's a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. We sing about that one of our songs, about Jesus Christ being the desire of nations. He's the one that's to come. He's the one we all need. We may not understand that and know that, but he is the one that we all need, and he's the one that will prevail. Haggai 2.21, God said, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the power of the kingdoms of the Gentiles. Matthew 24.29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Luke 21, 25 to 7, they refer to that before upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves, roaring, speaking of unsettled conditions, politically, economically, socially, and so on, men hearts failing for fear, and for looking after those things which come on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall be seen. The Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So Hebrews 12, 25 to 9 has something to say to us, something powerful to say to us regarding this. See that you do not refuse him that speaks. For if they did not escape to refuse him who spoke on earth, the references to Moses, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. God spoke in Old Testament days by the prophets and New Testament days by his Son. We're we'll told that in Hebrews chapter 1. His voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that may be shaken, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken or moved, let us have grace, and Martin says, let us hold fast, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Well, God he is a consuming fire. Now, the question is asked, will the church be raptured before the Great Tribulation begins? Oswald Smith felt that the church would go through the Tribulation, and here's what he said. It is a point on which great and godly men disagree, so I would advise all just to be ready. Romans 2, 4, and 5 asks this question, Do you despise the riches of God's goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads us to repentance? Then he speaks about people's hardness and unrepentant heart treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. In one of my churches years ago, 
there had been a bad accident, and one of the young men from our church had been killed along with three or four other young people from other churches in the area. A drunk man had run into them at night on the highway, and they'd all been killed. And um, this man from my church it was the only child that he and his wife had, and they never did have another child. And he became a Christian after he got the news that his boy had been killed. And here's what he said to me. What a fool I've been. But I had to wait till God put a coffin on my back before I would bend my knees. And sometimes we're like that. Sometimes the world is like that. And so Luke 21 says, Take heed, lest at any time your heart be weighted down with uh, intemperate indulgence and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unaware. So how do we handle it? He says, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, if he's referring there to the, to the rapture, then, of course, uh, those in the rapture will be only those who are uh, walking with God and uh, counted worthy. So this puts the whole thing on the base of works and not on the basis of the grace of God, which it has to be. This would mean a partial rapture, only those Christians who are really walking with God. I think if you study the, the, the context in Luke 21, uh, he's talking about what happened at the uh, destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70. Christ had warned his people that this was coming. And uh, we're told by Christ also that those days would get so severe that unless God intervened and shortened the days, no flesh would be saved alive. And then he says that for the sake of the elect, that's God's children, you and me, if you're a Christian, he's going to shorten those days. And otherwise, he said, there would be no flesh saved alive. He used to laugh about that when they fought with bows and arrows or with pistols and rifles. How in the world can the human race be wiped out? Nobody laughs today. Atomic weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and democratic nations are very much uh, afraid of some rogue nation getting atomic weapons and using them. That can very easily happen. We know that. All right, so we have to be very careful here. I think he was referring... You see, when he told his disciples... When you see the city surrounded by armies, get out, get out. Don't enter into the city. Get out if you're there. Well, the armies came and surrounded the city. How could they get out? Historically, here's what happened. The Roman armies came, surrounded the city, and this alerted all the Christians in the city to what Christ had said. Then the armies departed for a short period of time. The minute they were gone, every Christian in the area walking with God got out. I suppose there were some Christians that were cold and backslidden and didn't get out. I don't know. But it was a terrible slaughter when the Romans came back and eventually broke in. And the thousands, tens of thousands of people gathered in the temple. They were so sure that God wouldn't allow the temple to be destroyed. And uh, the armies, the soldiers, have been given a warning concern that they were not to destroy the temple. Apparently, a soldier running by with a flaming torch, he threw it in through the doorway. It caught on the cedar boards, and the temple burned. And like Christ, there was not one stone left upon another because keep people came years later to find the gold that had been in the inside of the temple that had melted and run down in the cracks and so on. In any case, it was a horrible, horrible time. They said blood ran over the curbstones during that particular time. He was talking about that, I think, when he said, watch and pray always that you may be kind of willing to escape all these things that should come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. All right. First Thessalonians 5 9 is being used to suggest that um, uh, we will be raptured before the tribulation begins. I'm just talking from the other point of view for the sake of argument because it's not clearly anywhere clearly stated that the church will not go through the tribulation. First Thessalonians 5 9 says, God is not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the opposite of salvation? The opposite of salvation is eternal condemnation. That's what Paul is talking about here. You know that the word wrath occurs 195, 194 times in the Bible. Yes, it does. And most of those references are to the wrath of God. Are we to assume that every time this phrase is used, uh, the wrath, that it refers to the Great Tribulation? That's nonsense, of course. It cannot be. Sometimes Enoch is appealed to as being the person who was translated to heaven uh, before the flood came. But he was translated 669 years before the flood came. And uh, had he lived uh, those 669 years, he would have been over a thousand years old. He'd have been older than Methuselah. No, it had nothing to do with 
him being translated has nothing to do with the fact that the church would be translated before the Great Tribulation came. Uh, there's an old saying that when people no longer recognize the nature of evil, when a nation reaches that state of depravity, judgment is a certainty. And just in closing, you know, if you if you think of the water baptism in the days of Noah, why did this come? Two reasons. The whole nation was corrupt before God, it says. And men were so evil in their hearts that every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually, continually, more depravity. And that was accompanied by violence. It says that in, in, over in Genesis there, that the earth was filled with violence. We have the same condition exactly today. We have more corruption, and then we have a lot of violence in society. We're seeing it and hearing about it all the time. In Ecclesiastes, it says that God made man up like they have sent up many inventions. I wondered what that word invention may, meant, so I looked it up. And it, it really meant, um, yes, it really meant mental fabrications. So in other words, men were fabricating a fly and creating thoughts in their mind about having sex with someone not married to or uh, being able to steal a million dollars or something else that's uh, wrong, mental fabrications. And so the reference is to what happened in the days of the flood and is happening today. Just as the world had a water baptism, it's going to have a fire baptism according to Second Peter, the third chapter. The earth also in the works of God therein should be burned up. Listen, everything you own is going to be burned up. Why are you placing so much faith in this? Are you going to say, hey, Joe, look, my fire is higher than your fire is. Is that how you're going to react? Listen, seeing then that all these things should be dissolved, Peter says, what manner of person you ought to be in all holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming or hastening the coming of the day of God, when the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt. With fervent heat. Listen, people, this is what we're heading into. But what can we do as Christian believers? Well, if you recall, Nineveh came very evil, and God sent Jonah, and he preached yet 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, it says, and they proclaimed a fast. Everybody was fasting. They didn't even water or feed their beasts. They were so concerned about avoiding the judgment of God. And when God saw they repented, he stopped. He didn't do what he was planning to do. I'm sure we can take from that the same thing today if the Church of God would repent of its wickedness, its immorality, and its love of money, and its neglecting of God and His Word. You know, I've read a great deal on revivals of the past, and people today in North America especially were crying about for revival because the moral situation is so severe. We don't know how to handle it, so we're praying to God for revival. But we're not praying the way they prayed in times past when God sent that revival. You know, there were times where churches actually had started two prayer meetings a day and carried this on for months on end until revival came. A prayer meeting at 6 o'clock in the morning, maybe one at 8 o'clock in the evening. A church is doing this, seeking the face of God. Fasting and praying was a common uh, method used then to bring the judgment of God. You know, there was a pastor in New England State, he was having, his name was Stoddard, and he was having what he had in uh, 35 years. It's, he had five different great revivals in his church that resulted in hundreds of people being saved. Other churches were not experiencing this, and so they had a meeting with Stoddard and demanded to know why was God uh, favoring him and not favoring them. He said, it's not a case of favoritism at all. He said, here's what we do. It's not what you people do, but here's what we do. We fast for revival, we pray for revival, we believe God for revival, and we keep on trusting God until it comes. You guys don't do that. You sit around just waiting for something to happen. He keeps saying God only sends revival when he pleases. There's, that element, of course, is there, and yet, at the same time, there's things we can't do as believers in Christ. I came across a book in a second-hand bookstore. I paid 25 cents for it. I wouldn't sell it to you for $25, but I don't draw you a 50. In any case, it's a tattered old volume, published 1832, and was called The History of American Revivals of Religion by a pastor named Calvin Colton. I understand this book has been republished recently. I don't know where, but I've heard that. In any case, he was saying something just along the lines of what I've been sharing a moment or two ago. He said, we were never satisfied with what he called insulated conversions. We use the word isolated conversions. He said, we fasted, we prayed, we believed God for his Bible. And then he made this statement. He said, I never heard of a single church that applied 
assiduously these three things, fasting, praying, and believing God. I never knew a church like that that didn't experience a revival. And I never knew a church who didn't do this to experience revival back in those days. They were not satisfied, he said, until the Holy Ghost came and took the work out of their hands and made the whole community aware of God. Then hundreds of people would be saved. We're not doing that today. We think we can preach up revival. So we're having conferences. And I'm not arguing against this, but you know, we have conference, have some great men come together that are concerned about revival. They have some prayer times and so on. But it's mainly, it seems to me, to be a, an attempt to preach up revival. And you can't do that. You can't preach up revival. You have to play it down. And do it people. That's where the nub is, because we're not, we're not ready to do that. We want revival. We want it on easy terms, on our terms, not on God's terms. And do it people. It only comes on God's terms. When we had revival in 71 in Saskatoon in our church, listen, we had prayed as you wouldn't believe. We, our prayer meeting went from 25 up to 150. We only had 175 members. Uh, occasionally there was a prayer meeting we had 170 people in, and uh, that kind of thing. And then we had a prayer wheel, and people were taking 15 minute slots and signing their name on a big new prayer wheel we had in the corner of the church on the bulletin board. And finally, we never had, it, it meant that any, time in 24-hour period there'd be somebody on their knees praying for revival in our church. We ended all our Sunday evening services with a half-hour revival praying, and the people understood we're going to pray for half an hour, we're going to pray for revival. And then we, we, we didn't lay this on the people all at once, so we couldn't have taken it, but we, over a period of time we did. And then we told people, now listen, uh, ask God to wake you through the night so you can get up for 15 or 20 minutes or half an hour and just pray for revival. Our people started doing that to people. You know what happened? Uh, people told me things like this. One lady said, you know, I used to be prayed out in five minutes. I prayed last night for 45 minutes. And I remember a couple, they, he pastored a large church in Eastern Canada. And uh, during revival meetings we conducted there, and he and his wife, he told us in one of the meetings what happened. He said, we used to, and when we went to bed at night, and she'd pray, kneel on one side of the bed, I'd kneel on the other side of the bed, she'd pray something, I'd pray something, we'd jump into bed. He said, we quit doing that, and here's what we do now. We hold hands, and we pray out loud. She prays, I pray, I pray, she prays. And sometimes we pray for 45 minutes. And that's what we have to think about here, people. Fasting and praying. Christ once said, this kind of demon, this kind comes not up of our prayer and fasting. And uh, Satan's spirit is in the world, you know. It's made very clear to us in Ephesians chapter 2, the spirit that now works and the children of disobedience. And it's not a case of going around and binding demons, which some people are trying to do. I agree totally with Jim Semble in New York, but this is just a waste of time, because the demon activity is the same after such things have been done as it was before. There's no, no real difference there at all. And so, dear people, God is looking at us, and I'm sure that it doesn't please God to have to send war and pestilence and hurtful beasts and all this kind of thing. That doesn't please God, but it's the only way to get people to listen. And since it's the only way, he's doing it in love to people. I remember hearing the problem just a short while ago. He said, you can't be angry at Mother Nature for what's going on. But could he be angry at God? Yes, I'm sure he could. Because that's how the age is going to end. Revelation 11, 18, remember, the nations were angry. And by wrath was come. Why were the nations angry? The people, they were angry because God was pouring out his wrath upon them because of the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, dear people, he's shaking the nations. He's going to shake them even worse yet. And we don't have to worry about that because in Zephaniah 2, verse 3, we read this. It uh, says, Seek righteousness, seek meekness, it may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. God's promise will be exactly the same if we do go through the tribulation. If we do, then the, the promises of God will be exactly the same. Uh, we can trust Him. He'll lead us through. And God will not, uh, He will not judge righteous people as He would judge unrighteous people. And we can trust in our God. Well, people, this is the conclusion of my message. I hope it's been a challenge and a blessing to you. And we have not tried to be scary. We're just trying to awaken people up to see what's really going on in the world today. God hasn't done, remember, without cause, anything that he's ever done. There's always been 
a cause. And back of it all is the fact that God is love. Yes, that God the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If he's not your Savior, don't wait till God puts a cross on your back before you bend your knees. Cry to God. Don't cry to God. Ask him to forgive you. Invite Christ to come into your heart and become your personal Savior forever. People makes all the difference in the world. And remember, Jesus told a certain young man who asked him to divide the inheritance with his brother. And Jesus had no part of that. He simply said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Somebody put it this way. They said, you know, we have so many labor-saving devices in our homes today that the feet stick out the windows, but we still don't have any time for God. And the people, we've, we've got to change this. We've got to change this and give quality time to the great God of the universe. Oh, may he grant us grace to see this and to do this for his sake and for our own sake too. Amen.